Hello. The next target in this course is going to be a theorem called the balog semeradi theorem, and it concerns um, some sets, which we've already met, and also a concept called additive energy, which turns out to be um, a rather important and fundamental concept throughout additive combinatorics. So I'm just going to say uh, a bit about what additive energy is, and then I can uh, state the theorem. And then um, actually what I'm going to do is split the proof, which comes into certain stages, into um, three videos. So I'm just going to provide it in a, a, a collection of three bite-sized chunks as an experiment. I think it's because I still have, have this uh, view that watching shorter videos is more pleasant experience than longer ones, um, even if the longer one is just a would be just a concatenation of the shorter ones. I think psychologically somehow it's nice to have shorter ones. I hope you agree or don't disagree too strongly. So what is additive energy? Um, well, let's take our old friend, the subset of an abelian group. And to avoid slightly boring considerations, I'll make it non-empty. And just in case I need it, I'll call the group G. Um, then an additive quadruple in A <coughs> is a quadruple X, Y, Z, W belonging to A to the fourth. So in other words, all its terms belong to A, such that X plus Y equals Z plus W. So we've seen the equation X plus Y equals Z plus W a couple of times earlier in the course, and um, here it comes again. And it turns out that uh, these things are very important, and counting them is important. <coughs> And so we have a name for how many there are. So the additive energy Ea of A is the number of additive quadruples, which I'll abbreviate as add quads in A. Um, and <clears throat> so let's just get a, a, a little observation, which is that uh, if x, y, and z, and w is an additive quadruple, <clears throat> then trivially w equals x plus y minus z. So uh, the number of additive quadruples in A is less than or equal to the size of A cubed, because you, can, you, you have freedom to choose x, y, and z. Once you've chosen them, w is forced. It may or may not also belong to A. Um, I don't think I'm going to use it in these uh, next few lectures, but I might. So I'll say let ea small ea b ea over a cubed which we'll call the normalized additive energy or you could think of it as sort of additive density so to speak And we can think of Ea over A cubed in the following way. Uh, if you pick x, y, and z at random, uh, independently at random, uniformly from A, then the normalized additive energy is just going to be the probability that W also belongs to A. So the normalized additive energy is a, is a sort of measure of the extent to which A is closed under the ternary operation x, y, z maps to x plus y minus z. Now, if you think about what uh, it would mean to be exactly closed, in other words, what it would mean if... So we, we, from this inequality, we know that Ea lies between 0 and 1. 
So to be exactly closed under this operation, in other words, for normalized additive energy to be one, uh, we need that whenever you've got three elements and you do this, so we can think of it like this, we, 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 whenever we've got x and we have y and z over here and we look at the, um, this, the, the vector that goes from y to z, uh, or from z to y, so that it's uh, y minus z, uh, then when we add that to x, we get something that's uh, also in the set. So actually you can visualize additive quadruples as sort of parallelograms like that. Uh, and if, you've, if, this were, if, if these things were in a vector space, then what this would be saying is that we've got an affine subspace. And what we have, in fact, is something a little bit like that. So if A is a coset of a subgroup of G, so that's a little bit like an affine subspace, or it is an affine subspace in the case that G is the additive group of a vector space, um, then... Well, not always, but anyway. Then um, we get that the normalized additive energy equals 1. And the converse is also true. Uh, so this statement is more or less trivial um, because the subgroup is closed under addition. And then if I just add the same thing to every element of the subgroup, then I'm going to add the same thing to this total. So that'll add the same, so, uh, and that's what I needed to do. Um, I'm not going to prove the converse here because it makes a nice exercise, which I will try to remember to stick on the examples sheet. Um, now let's have a, a simple fact about additive energy that relates it to some sets. So if a plus a is less than or equal to a constant times the size of a, then um, let's state it in terms of the additive energy rather than the normalized additive energy. The additive energy is at least c to the minus 1 times a cubed. So the normalized um, additive energy is at least the reciprocal of c, of the doubling constant, this is sometimes called. Um, now, this is just, uh, I suppose I could have stated this as a lemma, but I think I just want to put it in the running text. Um, let's see how to prove that. So to show this, let's define a function f from a plus a to uh, the non-negative integers. Actually, it's the integers because positive integers, in fact, by f of d equals the number of pairs a, b in a squared such that uh, b minus a equals d. In other words, it's the number of ways of expressing d as a difference of two. Oh, actually, I want b plus a, so that's, since it's not the difference. So uh, often one does talk about uh, a plus b equals d. Um, actually, it doesn't really make very much difference to this argument, but um, whether I talk about sums or differences. Uh, so now, let's make a couple of observations about f. So what is the sum over all d belonging to a plus a of f of d? Well, if you think about that, um, for every pair a, b and a squared, there exists some d such that a plus b equals d. f of d is the number of pairs that add up to d. So when you sum up all the f of d's, you're summing up over all d the number of pairs that add up to d. And since every pair adds up to something, you're summing up every, every single pair contributes exactly one to that sum. And so we get a squared. 
And now let's make another observation, which is that what is the sum fd squared? Um, well, I don't think I want to write something down. I just wanted to, to, to talk about this. So it's for each d, what is f of d squared? It counts the number of pairs of pairs a, b, um, both of which add up to d. So it's the number of pairs, uh, it's the number of quadruples, a hint here, uh, a, b, c, d, such that a plus b equals d, and, oh bother, I shouldn't have said uh, d. Uh, let's say the number of pair quadruples a1, b1, a2, b2, such that a1 plus b1 equals d and a2 plus b2 equals d. And if you think about that, you'll see that uh, a1 plus b1, sorry, a1, b1, a2, b2 is an additive quadruple because they both got the same sum. And as we sum over all d, we'll count up all additive quadruples exactly once. And so this thing here is just the additive energy of a. Um, but we also have that, uh, so let's write it like this. We've got that, um, we get that size of a squared equals some d of one times f of d. You can imagine why I'm doing that. It's because this is the first appearance in the course, if I remember rightly of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which um, is something that we're going to do. It just comes up all over the place in additive combinatorics, not even just additive combinatorics. Uh, so we take the L2 norm of the function 1, so that's sum over d of 1 squared to the half, and then sum of d fd squared, because I wanted an fd squared to come up somewhere and I ideally wanted it on the right hand side of an inequality like this. Uh, what were we summing over? We were summing over the whole of a plus a and uh, a plus a by hypothesis had size at most c times a so that's less than or equal to uh, c times a to the half times the additive energy to the half. And if you square both sides, we'll get that a to the fourth is less than or equal to ca times the additive energy. And therefore, rearranging, we have that the additive energy is, as I claimed, at least c to the minus 1 times a cubed. Right. Um, so the moral of that, if you want to sort of say it in a slightly imprecise way, is that if you've got a small sum set, then you've got a large normalized additive energy. Um, or just say a large additive energy compared with how big it could conceivably be. Um, so we could ask ourselves, what about the converse to that? Is that true as well? So if you've got a set with um, large additive energy, does that imply that it has a small sum set? And let's just see two reasons that that's not the case. Uh, in fact, one really quite trivial reason. Suppose we take a, a set that's got large additive energy. Uh, an example would be the set of all integers from 1 up to n. So I've just taken an interval of integers. Uh, if I pick three integers in this interval at random, the probability that the first one plus the second one minus the third one um, also belongs to the interval is clearly not going to tend to zero with n. It's going to be some constant, which we could work out, probably something like a third or something. I can't remember what it is. Um, so the additive energy is going to be within a constant of the maximum possible. So this definitely has large additive energy. Now let's just suppose I add any old elements to this set, some, some very spread out weird elements. Um, and say I add another n of them or something like that. Well, I've still got all these uh, additive quadruples that I had before. I haven't got that many more elements than I had before. I've, um, say, I've doubled the number of elements. So this constant here will have gone down by a factor at most 8. So it's still large. It's still within a constant of the maximum possible. But the sum set could blow up enormously. This uh, the sum set of just these elements here 
could easily be something like the maximum possible n, n plus one over two so it's perfectly possible to have really quite high additive energy and an enormous sum set another example is where you take i'm going to take a subset of z squared uh, i'll just take an interval um, from one to n going up the y-axis and an interval from one to n going up the x-axis so again this has got large additive energy because each of these two pieces has large additive energy and they're the same size but the sum set so this had size n and this had size n but the sum set is the whole of this square that has size n squared so again the sum set is far bigger than the original set even though the additive energy was large but if you look at these two examples, I think you'll see that uh, there's a rather tempting partial converse that one could perhaps conjecture, which is that we can always pass to a large subset where the additive uh, where, with, with a small subset. Here, for example, if I just pass to this subset, it's got a large, it's got a small subset. I mean, and here, if I just take this part and not that part, then I'll get a set with a small subset. So could that always be the case? And the bell summary theorem says yes in fact it is always the case so the theorem which i won't write formally in this uh, video but uh, we'll come to later on it says basically if the additive energy is or the normalized additive energy is at least little c then you can pass to a sum set um, where the density of the sum set inside your set is some constant that depends just on c and the doubling constant, the sort of capital C that you get uh, up here, also depends only on little c. Um, there can be a few steps towards proving that, and I'll, so the reason that I'm this video isn't doing the whole thing is that I'm just going to show you one important step. Um, now. I need a little bit of notation first. So the, the first step in the, in the proof is going to be a graph theoretic step. Uh, so in fact, I have a bipartite graph. So let uh, G, so I never use G for the abelian group, so I think I feel free to uh, let B, uh, G be a bipartite graph. With finite vertex sets. x and y um, so if x belongs to x uh, the degree is the degree of x i it's the uh, well so that's not the def dx is not the definition of the degree because i but uh dx stands for the degree, the degree is the number of neighbours of x, which will all have to lie in y. And we'll write, uh, I, I, I may feel the urge to use normalised degree, so we'll set delta x to be the degree divided by the largest that the degree could possibly be. Normalised degree of x. And, of course, that depends on knowing that x is in x, because if I take a vertex in y, then uh, delta y will be the degree of y divided by the size of x and not divided by the size of y. Uh, so in order to make sense of the normalised degree, you have to know and make clear which of these two sets your vertex lies in. Actually, I think I'm going to this, in this uh, video, I'm going to be talking about uh, well, not in this video, but uh, later on, I'll only care about um, bipartite graphs where the two vertex sets have the same size. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's nice to have this particular lemma that we're going to do um, in the more general setup where they can have completely different sizes. And sometimes that's very useful, by the way. Um, and I'll also write uh, dx1, x2 that's going to be the size of the neighborhood of x1 intersect the neighborhood of x2, or in other words, the number of uh, 
the size of the set of y such that x1y and x2y are edges of the graph g equals number of paths of length 2 from x1 to x2 and it's called um, the co-degree or sometimes it's called this the co-degree of x1 and x2 and we'll have delta x1 x2 equals dx1 x2 divided by y and that's going to be the normalized co-degree we'll definitely talk about the normalized co-degree at some point in this course yeah even if i don't in the end do it at this stage we'll see um and finally, another piece of notation will say that uh, the density of G is the number of edges I don't want to write E of G because that looks like additive energy, but uh, it's the number of edges of G divided by The largest possible number of edges of a bipartite graph with vertex sets x and y which is the size of x times the size of y uh, which we can also write as the size of x to the minus one times the size of y to the minus one times uh, the sum over all x of the degree of x which because that's just a, gives you the number of edges uh, and we could also say it's this is a very basic principle of double counting that if you've got a bipartite graph then the sum of degrees on one side must be the sum of degrees on the other side because they both count the number of edges um okay i think we've possibly got enough notation in place now to state the main lemma of this video so lemma let g be as above and let the density of g be delta then for every c greater than naught there is a subset um, <clears throat> x dashed of x with size at least delta x over the square root of 2 just comes out of the proof uh, such that um, the number of pairs x1, x2 in x dashed squared uh, with um, I'll deciding whether to use normalized co-degree now I won't use normalized co-degree so that with the co-degree or in other words the number of paths of length 2 um, smaller than uh, c times the size of y so notice that the number of the maximum possible number of paths is um, the size of y because each path is just determined by which vertex in y you go to before coming back to x2 uh, is at most 2c delta to the minus 2 times the size of y. Now something to uh, spot about this 
is that um oh wait a moment what have i just said uh, i didn't mean that it's because we're talking about the number of pairs in x dash squared so I, what i want here is just what i want to write here is the trivial maximum so the trivial maximum is the size of x dashed squared uh, so just a quick observation if c is um bigger than delta squared over two then this constant here is bigger than one and so we learn precisely nothing because obviously the number of pairs that satisfy any property is at most the number of pairs there are in, in total in x dashed so um c has to be small for this lemma to to be useful uh, or to say anything at all rather and um but uh, the main point is that we can choose C. It doesn't have to be that small. It just has to be you know, sort of some power of delta. So if, as long as it's sort of decently smaller than delta squared, we get some information. Although typically we need it to be a bit smaller than that. Um, so the proof is going to use a technique that uh, is used in many other places. So. It's called dependent random selection. So the rough philosophy behind this is that we are going to choose our subset x dashed randomly. Now, if I say that, that's very misleading because if I choose a subset x dashed of size, say uh, delta the size of x divided by the square root of two, purely randomly, I just choose a, a out of all the sets of this size, I choose one entirely uniformly at random. Uh, that's not going to do anything at all. If you think back to the example, in fact, let me just quickly scroll back. If we look back at these examples, if I were to choose a random subset of this set here, uh, sorry, this has got nothing to do with the graphs, I suppose, but it's a very similar, um, very similar phenomenon. So were I to choose a random subset here, it would be hopeless because I just choose a random part here and then a random part of this, and the random part of this would still have an enormous subset. And ditto here, if I were to choose a random subset and it would typically have about half its elements randomly scattered here and half its elements randomly scattered here and I would still have a, an enormous subset a subset a sum set I mean that would be uh, quadratic in in n in size so somehow here we need to find a sort of clever way to choose the subset and the same is true um, you can construct your own examples in this graph theoretic context so you can't just um, in fact let me just uh, I'll give a graph example because it's very easy. Supposing my graph looked like this. So this is x on the bottom and y on the top and I have a complete graph here and a complete graph here and no edges across. Then it's obvious that if I want to pick a subset of x such that everything's or as much as possible joined by lots of paths of length 2, I really don't want to have um, too many pairs of vertices coming from different sets down below because those aren't joined by any paths of length two. So really I want my proof to select for me um, one of these two subsets ideally or something like that in this case. And uh, so a purely random subset would be completely stupid but what we're going to do is choose a random subset not according to the uniform distribution on all subsets of a given size but according to a much clever, well, it's not that difficult, but a, a, a more carefully chosen, let's say, probability distribution. And in fact, it's rather easy to define. We're just simply going to take a random vertex up here and take its neighborhood. And you can see for this example, that works extremely well. If I put a complete graph here, I take a random vertex here, then either I'm going to pick the whole of this set here, if I picked my random vertex on that side, or I'm going to pick the whole of this set here. So that's wonderful. Um, and it turns out that that, I mean, that was a particular example, but it turns out that that approach works in general. So let's get going with the proof. Let y in y be chosen uniformly at random. And let x dashed be the neighborhood of y so yeah set of all x and x 
such that x, y is an edge. Okay, I will write e of g now. Is an edge of the graph. So that doesn't have anything to do with additive energy. Um, <clears throat> so keep in mind all the time that uh, x dashed is a random variable here. Uh, sorry, yes, is, is a random variable. It's a, well, it's a, it's a random set. So it's not a, a, a numerical random variable, but it's a, it's a random set. So I'll refer to it as though it's a fixed set, but it's random because uh, it depends on this y. So I could put that dependence in, call it x of y or something, or, or I could even just call it n of y, the neighborhood of y, but I prefer to call it x dashed. Um, what can we say about the size of x dashed? Well, the expected size of x dashed is, well, what is the size of x dashed? It's just the degree of y. So it's the average over all y in y of the degree of y, um, which is y to the minus 1 times um, the sum of the degrees. which is y to the minus 1 times the number of edges. And what is the number of edges? It's, uh, well, the, the graph had density delta, so it's delta times the size of x times the size of y, and so that equals delta times the size of x. So the expected size of x dashed is delta times the size of x. Now we're going to use actually Cauchy-Schwarz, but it's a particular case of Cauchy-Schwarz, but it's also a very, very important um, special case of Cauchy-Schwarz, uh, which is the fact that if I've got some random variable, which I better not call x, I'll just call it r, let's say, we know that, uh, so this is a sort of little remark in brackets, the expected value of r squared minus the expected value of r squared is, as I hope you will remember from a probability course that you've taken in the past, is just the same as... Uh, sorry, that was just a single barred r. It's just the variance of this random variable, and in particular it's greater than or equal to zero. So this, a fact that's extremely useful, in fact, you, it's both a special case of Cauchy-Schwarz and you can use it to, to prove Cauchy-Schwarz if you think about it a little. We get that um, the size of the expected value of a square is at least the expected value squared. So we get that the expected value of the size of x squared is at least as big as this thing squared, so delta squared times the size of x squared. Now that's going to tell us that on average you know x dashed the way we've chosen it won't be too small that's nice and um, I could have just st stuck there but I, I, I care about how many pairs of elements it's got uh, and then but we also care about uh, how many pairs satisfy this inequality here. So let's say that um, let B, which secretly stands for bad, be the set of all pairs x1, x2, such that uh, dx1, x2 is less than c of y, or c times y. Um, I want to think about how many bad pairs we expect to have. So let's do this by linearity of expectation. In other words, for each bad pair, let's think about the probability that it uh, belongs to B to um, x dashed. So when are we going to choose any pair? So if we've got a pair x1, x2, under what circumstances do we choose x1, x2? Well, remember, we choose a random y and we take its neighborhood. So we're going to choose both x1 and x2, if and only if y belongs to the neighborhood of both, well, neighborhoods, both of x1 and of x2. 
In other words, y has to lie in the intersection of the neighbourhoods. The size of the intersection is precisely d x1, x2. Uh, so the probability of picking x1 and x2 is less than c. I'll just say that once again because I think I uh, may not have said it quite as clearly as I might. The probability of picking x1, x2 is simply the density of the um, intersection of the neighbourhoods of x1 and x2. That's the normalised co-degree, if you like. Um, the co-degree here is less than c, so the probability of choosing both x1 and x2, if um, x1 and x2 are bad, is... Um, oh, sorry, this shouldn't be... St this should say the expected value, expected size of, uh, so the expected number of bad things that I choose in x dashed when I make the choice of x dashed. So, uh, so that's why I was talking about uh, uh, picking a random y. So if I've got a bad pair, the probability that I choose it is less than c. And... Um, so since the number of bad pairs is trivially at most the size of x squared, we get that this is less than c times x squared. I feel the urge to explain that a third time. I don't know why. but uh, So I say for each bad pair, the probability that we choose it is less than c because we only choose it if y belongs to the uh, intersection of the two neighbourhoods, which has density less than c. And so just by linear linearity of expectation, the expected number of bad pairs that belong to x dashed is less than c times the size of x squared. Um, so now we're going to use linearity of expectation again. So for any lambda, we therefore have... I'm actually not going to exploit the fact that I've got a strict inequality here because it doesn't really help me. Um, so I'll just lazily kind of let that slide into a non-strict inequality. So we therefore have that the expected value of um, the size of x dashed squared minus lambda times the number of bad pairs that lie in x dashed squared is greater than delta squared minus lambda c times x squared. And it remains to just choose my favourite value of lambda, so I, I want to make this not quite zero. Uh, so I'm going to make uh, lambda be delta squared over 2c. So let lambda equal delta squared over 2 times little c. Um, so that gives us then, I'll, I'll just write it out for, so we can look at it properly, uh, the expected size of x dashed squared minus delta squared over 2c. I could have done that all in one step, but I just sort of somehow wanted to make it, and I'm put turn it into greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to delta squared over 2 times the size of x squared. So now we use an age-old trick that if the average of something is at least a certain number, there must exist. So this is a random set x dashed, so there must exist an x dashed with this property. So there exists x dashed such that um, x dashed squared minus delta squared over 2c is at least delta squared over 2 times x squared. And then from that inequality, we've got the two things we want. So this implies that, first of all, since that's non-negative, uh, that it gives us that um, the size of x dashed is at least delta over the square root of 2 times the size of x, just ignoring this part here and then taking the square root of both sides. But also that bit is non-negative, so and 
the number of bad pairs in x dash is so because this thing here this left hand side is non-negative that tells us the number of bad pairs is at, is at most 2c over delta squared times x dash squared and if we go back to the statement of the theorem we'll see that's exactly what we wanted there's the 2c over delta squared times the size of x dash squared and here's this delta x over the square root of 2 um, and if we don't worry too much about what the bounds say, it's just the main point is we've got a large subset of the vertices, where large just means it, it obviously it depends to some extent on what the density was. And um, the number of bad pairs inside that subset is not too large, at least if C is small. And what did a bad pair mean? A bad pair meant that there weren't plenty of paths of length 2 from x1 to x2. So that's what that's saying, and another way of putting it is, for almost all um, pairs in x dashed, there are quite a few paths of length 2 joining them. So for almost all x1, x2 inside this set x dashed, you can find quite a lot of paths of length 2 from x1 to x2. Now it turns out that when we want to prove the bell oxen radius theorem, almost all is not quite enough. And also, make things worse. There are examples that show that uh, you can't, in this result here, replace almost all with all. However, there is something you can do, which is talk about paths of length 3 from points in x to points in y. So next time, or in the next video, I shall show that uh, we can pass the large subsets of x and y in such a way that you, for every x in the subset of x, and every y in the subset of y, you can find a path of length. Sorry, you can find lots of paths of length three that join them. But that's it for this video.